I grew up around this stuff. I, I, I'm talking about holiness. I, I grew up in, in, a, in what's called a holiness church. And I heard that word all my life. I, I've been around it all my life. I've heard it. I can't say I've understood it. But I'm getting there. As I've aged, as I've gotten older, as I've matured, that's a better word. I'm learning that holiness is not just about me and God. I, I, I think it's easy to... I think it's easy to get sucked into this idea that it's just about me and Jesus. That's all that matters. Holiness is not just about me and God. Holiness is really relational. And I'm amazed at how holistic this holy stuff is. How holistic it is. And it matters. And it's transformative. And it's life-changing, and it's important. We're in a series on 1 Peter for the next few weeks about being born again into a living faith, or living hope, I should say. And we are talking about some things today that are a pretty important part of what Peter writes about being holy if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 13, and I'm going to ask you to stand to honor God's word, 1 Peter 1, uh, starting at verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, remember that word, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges, a, such, who judges each person's work impartially, Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from this empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. All God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. There's some things about being holy I want us to, to unpack today. And this has been a really good challenge this week. It's been a really good challenge because I've been around it all my life. And there are some stigmas attached to holiness. There are some stigmas attached to what it means to be holy. And I wish I could just totally change all that in one message. But I can't, but God can. Here's, here's what Peter says. Right off the bat, he said, be prepared. Be prepared. There's something interesting. What he says right at the beginning, he, he talks about with minds that are alert and fully sober, fully sober, I have a fun memory. I had just went into the youth group. They let mid-high kids in at Pueblo First Church. It was a, a New Year's Eve lock-in. 
I was a junior higher. I, actually, I, might, I would have been a middle schooler, so I was probably about a sixth grader. I was probably 12 or 13 years old. I had a crush on a girl in the youth group. I mean, I had a big crush on a girl, and I was hoping at that lock-in at someone's house from our, our youth group, I, I just had a hope that that relationship would be reciprocated and would be manifested that evening. I could not wait for this gal to like me, and I found out she wasn't very good at the exit interview. She didn't like me, and I was crushed. I was crushed. And so I, I, I'm, you know, sixth grader, you know, I went out and I sat on the porch. It's, it's the middle of the night. It's eight degrees, eight degrees, and it was snowing. I'm sitting on the porch, no coat, no jacket. I'm sitting there pouting, and my older sister, three years older, her friend Roxy, Roxy Lutz, comes and sits by me because she's such a compassionate gal, and she sat by me. She said, are you okay, Kendall? And I looked at her, and I was just dead serious. I said, I'm just going to sober up. <laughs> now, there was no drinking. This was a Nazarene youth group. <laughs> there was no drinking there. I just looked at her. I said, I'm just going to sober up. This one gal doesn't like me. I'm just going to sober up. And she kind of looked perplexed. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I like so-and-so. She didn't like me. I'm just going to sober up. And I kept saying that to her, I'm going to just sober up. I'm going to just sober up. I, I'm just, and she goes, I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> so this word sober in this scripture, here's what it does mean. And actually, I wasn't too far off. It means self-control. It means level-headed. It means having or possessing a spiritual alertness, a, a spiritual awareness of what's going on around us. It's a mind, and, and here's where our English uh, kicks in, it's a mind that is prepared for the things that God wants to do. It's a mind that is prepared, a mind that is calm or steady. Okay, so it didn't fit me as a middle schooler. Calm, steady, able to weigh things. New Revised Standard translation of this passage says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. If you want to go farther back, and if you want to look a little bit more into the uh, original, it, it means gird the loins of your mind. I'm so glad that's not in there now. Because it just sounds weird, doesn't it? Gird the loins of your mind. Can we do that in the Church of the Nazarene? Gird... The loins of your mind meant this. They used to wear robes. And, and if you're in robes, you can't be active and you can't move and you can't run. You wouldn't run a marathon. You would not do the Team World Vision marathon or half marathon in a robe because you'd trip and you'd fall. So what they would do is they would take all the extra fabric and they would put a belt on and they would tuck in all of the stuff that's below the thighs into that belt so they could move and have movement and they could be ready for action like a marathon <laughs> or a half marathon in my case. Gird the loins of your mind. It's like saying in nowadays vernacular, roll up your sleeves and get to work. You got to get your mind straight if you want to hope completely. Last week we talked about this, this living hope. And if you really want to experience hope at its best, if you want to experience this living hope, it means you've got to get your mind right. You've got to have your mind focused because the world intoxicates, the world intoxicates us with negativity and discouragement and despair. Peter is saying, we don't have to get sucked into that. You got to get your mind right. Be prepared. Here's, uh, here's something fascinating. I'm thinking about the Apostle Paul, who is familiar with this part of the world. He writes to a church that's not far from some of the churches that received this letter and passed it around. 
He wrote this in Philippians chapter two, verse five, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Another translation says, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus. So if you wanna know what holy is, you look at Jesus. And the great question to ask is, and I know it got, uh, Charles Sheldon, great question, uh, what would Jesus do? It's really a good question. How would he live? What is the way he would, he would approach a situation? How would he approach it? How would he think? You see, Peter's saying you've got to have a prepared mind. And this is from someone who didn't always have a prepared mind. <laughs> someone that was very impulsive. <laughs> someone that acted in the flesh with incredible work from the Holy Spirit. With God's coaching and transformation, here is someone with incredible maturity saying you approach things with a prepared or sober mind. Um, I think we have to think in advance and be prepared for what we're going to do in certain situations. You, you prepare yourself, you think carefully and thoughtfully and properly. And I think all this is about being alert to spiritual realities. Uh, in the business world and in, 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 the, in, the, in the work world, we have certain terms that are pretty popular now like relational intelligence or emotional intelligence. Here's what I think he's talking about. You need a spiritual intelligence. And I'm not talking about just being smart. I'm talking about thinking properly with the mind of Christ. This helps get us ready for action. So this is all about right thinking. It, this is all about right thinking. That holiness has to do with thinking. In fact, there's a lot of thinking in this, and thinking is a big part of holiness. Thinking is a big part of holiness. Here's the second thing I see in this. As we gotta be holy. Verses 15 and 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because... I am holy. He's saying, I want you to be like me. Now the word for, for holy is this, this uh, Greek word called hagios, and it, and it means to be set apart for sacred use, for being pure and, and blameless. And many of you already know that. Um, I didn't know that until this week, but I was talking to a New Testament scholar, a friend of mine. I, got a, I used to be his pastor a number of years ago. He's kind of the expert on 1 Peter, so guess who I called? I asked Dr. Martin, I said, uh, let's talk about this. He said, you know, this word um, was, was unusual because, because this culture, the world, the Greek people in their mindset didn't use this word for religious deity. They, they didn't use this word for they're, they're gods, but the Jews did. And, and what they were saying is that the Greeks had these gods that did a lot of immoral things. You know, Zeus uh, did some bad things. And a lot of their gods were quite immoral, but the Jews were saying to people, no, 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 this, and this is the Greek version of that word, holy, it, it meant our God is not like your God. Our God is separate. Our God is totally different than your God. And here's what this is saying. I want you to be different. I want you to be like me. It, it means set apart for his special use. In this context, it's all about complete devotion for God, that you were created to be holy. That it's not just for a few people that are like the super Christians that really get it together and they go to church every week. You were created to be holy because you're made in the image of God, and God is holy, right? So you were created to be holy, and you were made for this, and you're to be who you're supposed to be. And that's what's heartbreaking, is when people settle for not being who they're supposed to be. It's be who you are. 
It's ethical. You're separated for devotion to God. God, God has a purpose for you that's so beyond this world. Uh, and some people are, are not living into this, this, this set-apartness, this separateness. Um, it's like what Pastor Rich was talking about to me this week. It's, it's like when you get a Waterford crystal vase that's incredibly valuable and you use that as a container for doing an oil change for your car. <laughs> Rich said, I don't do that. Jennifer would have him. Oh. And to, to run with the analogy a little bit farther, you think how God feels when he sees us? Lowering ourselves or allowing ourselves to be used for things that we were never created for. You see, the holiness of God is all about your character. It's about who you are. And it's meant to be lived out in our daily lives. It, it, it affects all you do. So Peter calls all readers, both the original hearers of this letter, but even the readers today, all the way to 2019, Peter calls all readers to make this living hope a reality by the way we conduct our daily lives. It's super practical. And the basis for all of this is God. And yeah, that's intimidating to be like God himself. <laughs> be holy as I am holy. In all that you do, Is there anybody else here that reads that and says, oh, yeah, right, yeah, like we could do that? He is the source of holiness. And we know him. We love him. And as we live to be more like Jesus, and really that's what, what holiness is. It's Christ-likeness. As we live to be like Jesus, and we answer that question, what would Jesus do in our behavior, in our actions, in our lifestyle? What would Jesus do? As we live that way, the Holy Spirit helps us to be more and more like him. He is the source. And as we know him, and as we get to know him more and more, and as we love him more and more, we adjust our lives and conform to him, his nature and his will. And all of this is from this it's from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant, Le Leviticus chapter 19. It's, it, there's a whole bunch of passages in Leviticus that's called the Holiness Code. And this is like almost a verbatim quote from Leviticus 19 too. So it's not like God changed. But he makes it possible for us to be holy. You're, you're not flying blind. So we've been talking about mindset, now we're talking about character, about what you do, about who you are. I'm, I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul wrote, um, Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, it's not on the screen, this is something that kind of hit me as we've been singing this morning, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, listen to this, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is all about right conduct. It's all about right conduct. New Revised Standard Version says, verse 15, this way, Be holy yourselves in all of your conduct. In all you do. It, it's, it's expressed in our behavior and our lifestyle. It covers our actions and our thoughts and our attitudes and our words. And Peter tells us to be holy in all of our conduct. Attitude and action. 
And yet, this is not, this is not a holiness that is embodied by just a set of rules. Here's all the stuff you can't do if you're holy. Let me, let me do a little sidebar real quick. Because here's the motivation for this. If you have your Bible, turn to verses 17 through 21. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, you live out your time as foreigners with here in reverent fear. And it talks about how you're redeemed. See, in this day and age, in this, in this culture, you had to belong to a household that if you were not in a household, you, you're a nobody. And you could get into a household in two ways. You were born in or bought if you're not the owner and his wife. They called it house born or covenant bought. As Christians, you're not money bought in God's household. You're also not house born according to the old household, the old covenant. But something that had never happened and something that's just amazing and something that just baffles your mind, the father, the homeowner, gave up his son, exchanged the life of his son to buy sons and daughters, and he didn't use silver and gold and things that are perishable, but it was the precious blood of his son, Jesus, that is imperishable. And it was unheard of. That's the one who calls you to be holy. The one who invites you into the household. Oh, not as a servant, but as a child of the Father. <laughs> and it reminds me of a great story. One of my coworkers years ago is a guy named Kevin Borger. Kevin was on staff with me and both of our sons played little league football. They called it gridiron gladiators. Fourth, fifth, sixth graders. Uh, Kevin's son played and our son Trevor played and we were at a game together and they happened to be on the same team, the Hutch Blue Hawks. And right before the game, I saw Kevin kneeling down with his son and, and he was giving his son a pep talk and I thought, I wonder what he's saying, you know, because I've never seen Kevin all that fired up, but he's all kind of... And so I, I asked him later, I said, what were you doing? He said, well, I just knelt down and looked at Hayden. I said, hey, I want you to know before you go and take the field, my name is on the back of your jersey. <laughs> and I, my, now let me just tell you where my thought is going, like, what, are you trying to pressure him that he better be good and he better be awesome or are you going to embarrass the family name for generations to come? He said, no, 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 no. What I was saying is I want you to know my name is on the back of that jersey. So, yes, I want you to go out, play your heart out. I want you to do your very best. I want you to represent and all that. But he said, I want you to be a good sport. And I want you to be kind. And I want you to be someone that plays hard but plays by the rules. I want you to represent my name well. Now go, go get him. <laughs> I got to thinking about that, man. I need that pep talk. Because when someone wrongs me or someone doesn't do me right, the first thing I want to do is be vindictive. I want to get in their face. I want to get in their grill. I want to send them a nasty little email. I want to send them something back. But I'm reminded that my, my father's name is on the back of that jersey. So be holy in all you do. <laughs> How would that transform marriages when, when we want to lash out at our spouse because we didn't like the way they did something? We want to lash out and whoa, 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 whoa. My father's name is on the back of my jersey. <sighs> we got to be prepared, we got to be holy. Here's the third thing is we've got to be loving. We've got to be loving. Verse 22 challenges me. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere 
th- that word means authentic and genuine. It doesn't just mean like warm, fuzzy. It's, it's honest, sincere, genuine, authentic. So that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. I, I think the first task of obedience in being holy in being prepared, in having the right mindset, in having the right character, is a love for others. That's why that line resonated so much with me this morning with the song right before the message, lead me in your love to those around me. When we realize we're separated for God's use, we love. This is what you're created for. This is what you were built for. This is the image of God. You see, a holiness that is only about God and me, and I mean individualistic, is an empty holiness. A holiness that is just about God and me is an empty holiness. But being holy not only affects our relationship to God, but all of our relationships, our marriages, our friendships, our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our grandparents, our work relationships, our business relationships. I was talking to someone in our connect group last week afterwards, this is the meeting after the meeting. She's a doctor, so her thoughts are are helpful to me, the way she sees things. Um, She was talking about last week about some things that that I had said in the message about living hope. And and she was talking about how we have a part in this. That I I think sometimes we we think we sit on our hands and we, you know, praise and pray and say, God, oh, just spirit, fill me. And then, then everything's all fixed and we're there. But you don't live holiness in a vacuum. You live in a day-to-day life. And as we were talking about this, I got to thinking about verse 22. It says, after you have purified your soul. This is not a legalistic thing you earn. This is not something you do. But you work in tandem with God. You respond to God's love. You, you partner with God. Because doing a transform- transformative work in you. You show it by loving. You don't go move off to a monastery and never have impact in interaction with anybody. You don't do that. You have to work this holiness out. And the result of all this is a genuine love for your fellow believers and for other people in general. Once more, holiness is not so much about a list of prohibited things or behaviors. Quite honestly, that's how I grew up. That if you didn't do all these things, you were holy. <laughs> it's not all about what you don't do. It's, it's more about what you do. My youth pastor said something brilliant. And I remember him talking about this, and it made an impact because I actually still remember it. If you spend your time doing the things you're supposed to be doing, you won't have time to worry about doing the don'ts. (laughs) See, holiness builds community. It it builds a community, the community of mutual love and support. And, And Peter talks about this love for other believers. And Dr. Troy Martin, the one who I was telling you about earlier, he was teaching me about this whole idea of brotherly love in the original translation, the words that they get this from is womb sharer. Your brothers and sisters were womb sharers. And when we come to know God and God works in us and we become brothers and sisters with others in Christ, it's, in a way, it's womb sharing. And after you have purified your soul, you love deeply that that's what you're supposed to do. That's what the natural outcome is. And, and 
brothers who don't get along and brothers and sisters who have issues, it's a soul problem. And something has marred their soul and you gotta get your soul right. And if your soul is infected with greed or anger or bitterness or unforgiveness, you can't love your brother or sister and really experience this living hope Peter's talking about. And that's when I was sitting there thinking, I like our mission statement even more. You know what it is? Love God, love each other, love the world. A lot of us got the love God part down. We're good. Love each other, eh, a little harder. Love the world, <laughs> are you kidding? What does it look like, this love? Apostle Paul helps us, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Chunk of the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. Hmm. It keeps no record of wrongs. I like that. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, always perseveres. I love how the message says, verse 8, love never dies. Always hopes. It's a living hope. Dynamic, active, vibrant, not dying and decaying. So this is all about loving deeply. This is all about loving deeply. The words that we've been talking about make holiness a matter of the whole person, mind, body, and soul. It, it, it includes thinking and feeling and being and doing and loving. It's all about to be, it's all about being set apart for God's use. It's supposed to be pure, blameless. Genuine holiness is a deep love, not just for those who are easy to love but a deep love for those that we find the most difficult to love. When I said that, you know as well as I do, some people's faces came to your mind, if he only knew so-and-so. If he only knew what they did to me. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Think holy. Be holy. Do holy. We've tried, to, and we've gotten a lot better, we've tried to make holiness a list of things we don't do, but God describes it as what we do. Loving deeply. I want to give you a few takeaways, and I, I hope you'll keep interacting with this scripture through the week. Here's, here's the first thing is, I want you to think about this. Which of these three aspects of holiness do you need to concentrate on this week? Thinking, being, or doing? Maybe all three. But maybe there's one that, eh, I need to work on that. The second thing is, which, which aspect do you look forward to exploring in your connect group this week? And uh, conversely, which one not so much? <laughs> hmm. Third thing, which, which aspect of these three, talk about thinking holy and being holy and doing holy, which of these three do you need the help of the Holy Spirit this week? 